Good afternoon, or if you're joining us from the West Coast, good morning, and thank you for joining our session on WSRI's latest prescription drug research. My name is Eric Harrison, and I'm the Director of Data Development at WCRI. I would like to introduce my colleagues at this time. Dr. Venela Thumala, a policy analyst at WCRI, will be discussing new findings on off-label prescribing of prescription drugs. She will be followed by Dr. Bogdan Savage, who will present findings on the effect of opioid-related policies on the prescribing of opioid and non-opioid pain medication. Welcome to you both. And Venela, let's begin with your presentation. Thank you, Eric. Hello, everybody. Uh, in this presentation, we'll focus on dispensing patterns of two groups of drugs, gabapentinoids and topical analgesics. We will look at off-label uses of these drugs and examine whether the utilization patterns that we see are consistent with guideline recommendations and highlight, highlight areas that warrant increased oversight. Over the last several years, prescription cost drivers have changed considerably. Each quarter here on the slide includes prescriptions that were dispensed in the quarter for less than three-year-old claims and data is pooled from 28 states. We see that the share of all prescription payments that were for opioids decreased from 21% in 2015 quarter one to 8% in 2020 quarter one. Compounds, which are in the blue line, which were once a prominent cost driver of uh, uh, prescription drugs in many states also decreased substantially. Over this period, drug spend for dermatologicals or topicals grew from 11% in 2015 quarter one to 21% in 2020 quarter one. Cost share of anticonvulsants also increased over this period, followed by a recent decrease as generics for Lyrica became available. Gabapentin and pregabalin, known as gabapentinoids, account for 90% of payments and prescriptions in this category. In today's presentation, we will preview findings related to dispensing of topical analgesics and gabapentinoids. There is wide variation in prescription cost share for dermatologicals from 40% of drug spend being for dermatologicals in South Carolina to 5% in states on the left-hand side, Iowa, Arkansas, Minnesota, and Texas. Yellow portion of this bar denotes physician dispensed dermatologicals. And as you see, a significant portion of dermatological payments are for physician dispensed prescriptions, especially in states that are on the right side with the exception of uh, Pennsylvania and Delaware. We will be addressing trends in the cost share of physician dispensed dermatologicals in, our, uh, in more detail in our upcoming drug, drug trend study. If we look at the types of topical analgesics that are dispensed, topicals in, uh, containing diclofenac and lidocaine account for 93% of topical payments across the 28 states in 2020 quarter one. And as you see in the second column, uh, these products are approved for a limited set of conditions, topical diclofenac for osteoarthritis of the knee and lidocaine for nerve pain for shingles. So these products are predominantly used off-label in workers' compensation, that is for conditions that are not approved by the FDA. But off-label use does not mean that it's not appropriate to use these medications because these products are recommended for several other indications by guidelines. For example, topical diclofenac is recommended for sprain strains of the knee, elbow, ankle, foot, hand, and wrist by ODG guidelines. And they say that there is little evidence for effectiveness for other body parts. Now, if you look at workers with topical diclofenac and review their medical transactions over a one-year period following the injury, we see that 56% of claims in the median state had a documented diagnosis of soft tissue injuries of joints for which the topical diclofenac products are recommended. So these are joints that are amenable to topical application. And it ranges from 46% to 70% across the states. But that means that 40% did not have soft tissue injuries of these joints. And of these cases, many had diagnosis for back, shoulder, and hip sprains and strains for which there is little evidence of effectiveness according to ODG guidelines. Um, in recent years, as opioids decreased and compounds decreased, 
there are relatively a narrower group of therapeutic options avail available for pain management. So topicals are probably being dispensed because they have relatively less systemic side effects or because some patients may not be tolerant to a certain oral pain meds. Uh, but we want to highlight some cost concerns that are associated with topical diclofenac. If you look at the types of diclofenac products that are being dispensed, diclofenac sodium gel 1%, which is the recommended product in ODG guidelines, accounts for majority of prescriptions in the median state, 82% of diclofenac topicals and 18% of payments. Yellow portion denotes the share for diclofenac sodium solution, which accounts for 8% of prescriptions, but 57% of payment share in the median state because these products are higher priced. And there is wide variation in dispensing of, these, uh, of this product from 0% of diclofenac topicals to 54% in, uh, across the study states. And this product is not, is not recommended as first line treatment in ODG guidelines. And another topic I wanna to touch on related to dermatologicals is private label topicals. Private label topicals are independently manufactured over the counter products. Uh, examples are Lidopro, Teresin, which in include uh, ingredients such as menthol, methyl salicylate, capsaicin, and lidocaine, which are available over the counter. They're not FDA approved and not recommended by evidence-based guidelines. Uh, and these products also have a much higher price tag compared to comparable products that are available OTC. For example, Teresin, uh, the price, average price is $1,000 in our data, whereas uh, lidocaine uh, menthol patches uh, are sold over the counter as IC hot patches for a small fraction of that price. And among claims with topicals, private label topicals are rarely dispensed in half of the study state, but at least a third of the claims have private label topicals in uh, Louisiana, New Mexico, Maryland, Illinois, and South Carolina, and it's even higher in Delaware. Moving on to anticonvulsants, about 90% of prescriptions and payments are for gabapentin and pregabalin. And these products are indicated for nerve pain from shingles and uh, seizures and certain other conditions like fibromyalgia and neuropathic pain associated with diabetes and spinal cord injury. Guidelines, have addi guidelines additionally recommend these products on a limited basis for radicular pain syndrome, spinal stenosis, complex regional pain syndrome, uh, and other conditions. So if you look at the claims receiving gabapentinoid, first of all, whether an injured worker is prescribed gabapentinoid prescription varies significantly across states from 3% in California to 1 in 10, 10 in Louisiana, Massachusetts, and New York. But across these states, we see that workers did not have a clearly documented FDA approved indication, which is denoted in the blue and yellow bars. Most workers had a diagnosis for neuropathic conditions, which is denoted in the green, dark green bar. Um, and guidelines recommend gabapentinoids for these conditions, at least on a limited basis. But as you see in the light green portion, there is a sizable proportion not having a documented neuropathic diagnosis, which is not consistent with guideline recommendations. And another point that calls for additional evidence is whether injured workers are being prescribed daily doses of gabapentin that are sufficient to manage neuropathic pain. FDA recommends daily doses of 900 to 1800 milligrams for post herpes neuralgia. And another Cochrane review of uh, randomized control trials of gabapentin use for neuropathic pain reported that moderate pain relief was achieved at 1800 to 3600 milligrams. In our data, median daily dose of workers with mu multiple gabapentin prescriptions is 900. So at least half the workers have lower dose than doses recommended for other neuropathic pain conditions. So when gabapentin is being prescribed off-label for workers' comp neuropathic conditions, it is unknown whether the doses being prescribed are sufficiently managing their pain. To quickly recap, we presented a brief preview of some of the findings from our upcoming uh, prescription drug studies. First up, we saw that prescription cost share of dermatologicals increased and drug spend for dermatologicals varies across states. Physician dispensed dermatologicals are a substantial cost drivers in several states, including Florida, Georgia, Illinois, Maryland, South Carolina, and Virginia. 
In terms of gabapentinoids and topical analgesics, we see that these drugs are often being used for conditions not recommended by guidelines. We see private label topicals being dispensed frequently in some states, especially Delaware, and that workers may be receiving subtherapeutic doses of gabapentin. That concludes my presentation, and we will now hear from Dr. Bogdan Savage. Thank you, Vanilla. Um, let me just pull up the slides. Uh, hopefully you all can see those now. So, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, so today I would like to show you preliminary results from the study that examines effects of opioid related policies on various measures of opioid use and use of other medical care. As Dr. Timula mentioned, Opioid utilization decreased substantially over the last decade. We see this when uh, looking at the percent of workers with opioids, as well as, at the, amount, as uh, well as the amount of opioids prescribed. So if you look back 10 years ago, nearly half of workers with more than seven days of lost time had an opioid prescription. By 2018, it dropped to about 30%. And when you look at all workers, the percent of opioids decreased from about 20% to about 10%. On the right side of this chart, we see that the average morphine equivalent amount of opioids per claim with opioids also decreased. It dropped by more than half over this time period. Uh, but if you follow other studies from WCRI on this topic, we know that many workers continue to receive opioids on a prolonged basis. So this decrease in opioids is not a surprise to many people in this virtual conference room. Many providers, policymakers, and other system stakeholders were involved in efforts to address excessive opioid prescribing in the workers' compensation system. The policymakers at state and federal level have also intervened with a number of different policies. And the state level policies are a primary focus of this analysis. Some of these were directly related to the care provided to injured workers, uh, although most of the measures were not specific to workers' compensation. Over the next couple of minutes, I'll highlight our findings for two of these policies. Requirements that prescribers check with the prescription drug monitoring programs, or PDMPs, and limits imposed on initial opioid prescriptions. So we examined several questions. First, do we see that opioid-related policies affected the use of opioids? And the answer is yes, but there are some unexpected results. Second, since policies reduce access to opioids, what did workers do to deal with their pain? Perhaps they used care that treatment guidelines recommend as an alternative, alternative to opioids for managing pain. And we see this response for some of the injuries um, and less so for others. Finally, did these policies affect duration of temporary disability benefits? We see little evidence of that. So let's talk about what we learn about the impact of must access PDMPs on use of opioids. So prescription drug monitoring programs or PDMPs are essentially registries of all opioid prescriptions. And the idea behind them is that they help identify patients who have large number of opioids over opioid prescriptions over a short period of time, maybe from different providers. These policies are, new, are not new. Um, some of them date back more than 80 years ago. And that's, you know, well before the internet age and before sharing uh, databases online, although most of them are a bit more re recent. The evidence about the first wave of PDMPs suggests that they were not effective. Prescribers did not have to register with the program and they were not required to check with them. So in our analysis, we examined a more recent variation of these policies uh, that require physicians to check the PDMPs before issuing the new prescription. And that's what we call a must access PDMP policy. So let's start from the descriptive analysis and that's what we show here. Uh, we compare the amount of opiates prescribed for claims before the state implemented a must access PDMP, that's the blue bar, and after, that's the yellow bar. 
we use data from 32 states at 12 months maturity, and of those states, 18 implemented must access PDMPs during the time frame of our study. And for those 18 states represented one you know, together, we see that the amount of opioids prescribed decreased after the state implemented the policies. But what about states that did not change their policies, right? We constructed similar measures for these states. They cover similar time periods. And we find that average amount of opioids in these states also decreased, but to a lesser extent. So this means that we cannot look only at the states that implemented policies and say, well, this is the overall effect. We have to account for prescribing trends that were happening even without the must access PGMP policies. And we need to adjust for other factors. And that's what we do next. Here, we show you how much different outcomes change in response to must access PGMPs next to net to of all other factors. So the first line shows that must access PGMPs reduced the overall amount of opioids prescribed by about 12%. Going down the list, we do not see much change in whether workers receive an opioid prescription. And we see about 5% decrease in the number of, of opioid prescriptions for claims with opioids. So this used to be consistent with policy goals. Must access PGMPs reduced the amount of opioids prescribed while not changing uh, whether workers have access to some opioids. And we've done a little bit more digging into these numbers. Um, we found that most of these effects are driven by low back injuries, sprains and strains, and inflammations, while there was very little change for fractures. We also uh, found that these policies contributed to a reduction in longer term opioid prescribing. Next policy that we examine are rules suggesting that first opioid prescriptions should not be for more than three, five, or seven days of supply, although these policies allow exceptions for surgical pain, um, professional, uh, for, for, and exemptions for physician professional judgments. And the idea is that if you have limits uh, on initial prescriptions, that's what we study here, you might avoid extensive new prescriptions to treat acute pain. And this may lead to lower longer term prescribing. And we know that these policies were effective in reducing the duration of the first prescription. The question is, well, what happens to the claim overall? And let's look at one of the measures. Um, this on this chart, we show numbers again for the states that introduced limits and for states that did not introduce limits on initial opioid prescriptions. And 14 of the analysis states introduced limits on initial opioid prescriptions during a study period. And again, we have numbers before and after, and we see a decrease in the percent of claims with opioids from about 11% to about 8% for the states that went after the states introduced the limits on initial prescription. So it does translate into changes in overall prescribing in a claim. But we also see similar decreases in states without limits. That's the second set of bars that we have on this chart. So this suggests that we actually might not have a conclusive answer about from the simple graphs about what are the effects of the policies. So we need to do a little bit more complex analysis. And that's again what we do here. Here we show you the effect of the policies limiting initial opioid prescriptions, net of all other factors. And uh, first line shows that we actually see no effect or little effect of the policies on the amount of opioids prescribed for all claims. But the second row on this chart has found something more interesting or more surprising to us. We see that there is a potentially positive effect of the policies on the percent of claims with opioids and number of opioid prescription for all claims. So we see in the second chart, we see about 14% increase in the percent of claims with opioid prescription and then 17% increase for number of opioid prescriptions for all claims relative to no policy case. And this is unexpected. Uh, 
We also see in the last chart, I'll get back, I'll get back to this result in the next slide, but we also see a decrease in opioids prescribed among, among claims with opioids, and that would be more consistent with policy goals. So how do we interpret, interpret the first effect? Right, so one way to think better about this is to look at predicted outcomes for cases with and without limits and see how these outcomes change under those two scenarios. And that's what we show here. We know that opioid prescribing declined even without policies that limited duration on the first opioid prescription. And that's the solid line here. We've seen this decline across many states. And however, when the states implement the policies, this measure did not decline as fast. And that's the dashed line. So what may be the reasons for this? Well, maybe doctors maybe were somewhat more willing to prescribe opioids if the prescriptions were limited to in duration, right? If they only prescribe like three or five days and the worker will only receive a limited number of prescriptions, then they might have, might, but they might be okay to provide this as a pain relief to injured workers while they would not have done that relative to how they were prescribing before. And that's exactly what we see. Um, in our study, we actually you know, provide much more information about this. And we see that there's lots of shift from, you know, the biggest shift in this example is from given from zero prescriptions before to just one prescription that lasts only a couple of days according to the limits. There is also some hints of an evidence that additional exposure may result in longer term use of opioids for some injured workers. And maybe uh, that longer term opioid use. So this might suggest that this longer term use may indicate potentially mixed uh, results of the policy, right? So the limits may reduce the initial prescriptions, but for some workers, they'll get somewhat more opioids and they might develop longer term opioid prescribing, although that's a very small share of the overall effect. So what about effects of policies on other care? Here I highlight your selected measures for must access PDMPs for back cases. We know that these policies reduce the amount of opioids, right? We already have seen it in the last couple of slides and we reiterated here that the amount of opioid prescribed decreased by about 12%. At the same time, we see about 9% increase in the number of non-opioid pain medications. And these are often considered in treatment guidelines as an alternative to opioids for managing pain. And we also see somewhat weaker evidence for other injuries, although the evidence often points to an increase in number of non-opioid pain medications. So this is something that uh, stakeholders should be paying greater attention to. So that's our findings. We find that policies did contribute to a decline in opioid prescribing, but some of the effects were not as expected. Uh, there is also some evidence of an increase in use of alternative care for managing pain. And you will find more details about different effects once the study is released. Thank you for joining us today. Those were some very interesting. Well, great. That was a great presentation. And I uh, want to welcome uh, Dr. Venela and uh, Bogdan. Uh, to the conversation. And um, uh, we want to uh, first tell you that um, uh, for those who might be looking for slides, uh, slides are currently preliminary. And so, um, so they are currently uh, subject to change. Um, so, uh, but we will be providing a recording and that should be up by the end of the day and should be available for three months after uh, on the conference app. Um, so with that said, uh, let's uh, jump into our questions. And the first question comes from Fred. And it's uh, Fred says, there are reports of an increase in opioids during the COVID-19 pandemic. Did you see any increase in opioids prescribed uh, to injured workers? I can take that. Um, thank you for that question, Fred. Uh, so we looked at, uh, um, changes in opioids up to uh, May of 2020. Uh, we have data till then. 
And we compared the trends, monthly trends from January to uh, May in 2020 and a similar group in 2019. And what we, we don't see any evidence of an increase in opioids. Um, we do see that uh, there are fewer claims that received opioid prescriptions. Um, there is a slight uptick in MME per opioid, uh, MME per claim with opioid opioids um, temporarily in April, there is an increasing trend and then it uh, came back down. So, and that could be because of the underlying differences in the mix of injuries. Um, so overall, we don't see an, any evidence of an increase in uh, opioid use up until May. Great. Our next question comes from Susan. Did any other drugs other than dermatologicals and anticonvulsants increase as opioids decreased? Thank you for that question. Uh, we do see that NSAIDs are uh, the top cost driver in uh, several states, and there have been recent increases in prescription payments for NSAIDs in some states, uh, um, especially uh, California. Uh, there is a recent uh, CWCI uh, study that reported increase in some NSAIDs. Uh, we, we see that too in 2020 uh, quarter one, uh, which is the last point in our uh, quarter in our uh, prescription drug study, we do see that uh, uh, some new drugs uh, such as uh, phenoprofen calcium account for uh, almost a quarter of all NSAID prescriptions and they are higher priced. Uh, so we, we do see some emerging cost drivers even within uh, NSAIDs in some states. And there's also an increase in antidepressants in some, some states. Next question comes from David. As the use of dermatologicals is increasing, how are states addressing this issue? And are there any policy examples uh, from other states? That's a, a great question and uh, we cannot answer it completely. Uh, but if we go back to that slide um, on uh, dermatologicals and if we look at the interstate variation, uh, if we see the in, in the variation in terms of uh, pharmacy dispensed dermatologicals, uh, leaving out a few states like Pennsylvania, Massachusetts and Delaware, uh, we see that it ranges from 5% to 15%. And when you add the physician dispensed dermatologicals on top of that, it, it expands the, the, the extent of variation uh, from 5% to 40%. Um, so physician dispensing is one of the uh, factors that seem to be driving some of the wide variations across states. And uh, there are states that have addressed physician dispensing uh, with policy. Another, um, another example uh, of, if you look at states where there have been recent decreases in dermatological prescriptions or dermatological payments are uh, states that have implemented drug formularies. We, we do see uh, reductions in California, uh, New York in the, in the latest, in the last one year where we have the post-formulary data. Um, Kentucky, those are some states where we have seen, uh, we're starting to see reductions in dermatological payments. Thank you. Just going to take one question and then we got to wrap it up. Uh, Cora asks, initial opioid prescription limits can be seven days or 30 days. Big difference in developing dependence, five to seven day predictive of use of one year later. How did you deal with this? And if we can have kind of a short answer, unfortunately, Bogdan. Well, that, that, that's a very good question. I mean, in, in our analysis, when we are looking only at policies, we um, focused primarily on a newer uh, newer uh, wave of policies that sort of limits prescriptions to less than 14 uh, days of opioids. Uh, but it's, you know, it's in, in a couple of other prior studies that we've done, even the ones that we've done last year with uh, Dr. Thielman and I, uh, we've, we've looked at how the lens of initial production uh, initial prescription, how does it predict longer term use? And we do see that, you know, the, the more you, opioids are prescribed initially, the, low, the higher the likelihood uh, of uh, longer term opioid use. So that's something to monitor uh, clearly. It's, it's an, important, an important factor. 
Great. Well, th thank you everyone for all the questions. Unfortunately, we're out of time. And so we look forward to seeing you in our next session. In the meantime, please uh, make sure to rate this session to let us know how, how, we've, uh, how we did. And uh, again, uh, thank you to Dr. Bog Bogdan Savage and Dr. Venal Thumla for your great presentation. And we'll see you in the next session.